all very welcome to the Connected Tech seminar series. Um, so Connected Tech is one of our three pillars with our wider Connected seminar series, which is designed to bring together um, experts to discuss the key challenges and the key trends in industry and in wider society. And the other two pillars are Connected Globe and um, Connected Planet, which focuses on sustainability. And the seminar series is um, designed and is open to our postgraduate um, network of students and alumni within the Faculty of Business. Um, today is the second of our six week um, series, which is focusing on emerging um, technologies. And these seminars are running each Friday at 3 p.m. So we're delighted to be joined today by Alex Gibson, who is a lecturer in marketing and the assistant head of the School of Marketing here at TU Dublin. And Alex is also an expert in the area of AOR and VR. Um, he is an advisor to Tech Ireland and he's also the founder and chairperson of AORV or Innovate Conference and Expo. So we're really delighted that you have joined us today, Alex, for our seminar, Leveraging Immersive Technologies. Um, and just as I pass over to you, I'll just remind the participants to remain muted um, and please do pop any questions that you have into chat and I'll keep an eye on those. Lorraine, many thanks indeed, and thanks to everybody joining us from the uh, TU Dublin academic community and uh, a wider field. You're very welcome this Friday afternoon. Uh, I'll try and keep this presentation as high energy and uh, laden with video and images as much as we can, given the, the time of the week that it is. Um, there is opportunity, hopefully at the end, for some questions uh, in relation to myself. And if you want to do further info, uh, reading around the topic, I've uh, posted a lot of those on a couple of Twitter accounts. And I think, Lorraine, you have them up, up already in the chat. Uh, which is the, the link tree linked to what I do. And there's one article, and only one article is background reading, I'd recommend you all have a look at, which is the famous Michael E. Porter, uh, who uh, was writing about this topic just uh, four or five years ago, quite prescient uh, in terms of the need for all organizations as he saw to have an A or strategy. Of course, uh, the timing of this seminar uh, is particularly opposite in the context of what we've been seeing happening uh, in the world of technology in, in recent weeks, most notably, I suppose, the um, the, the, what's been happening in terms of Meta and Facebook. So hopefully you can see my slides. Maybe, Lorraine, you could just give me an audio that you can. I think you can, and we're good to go. Okay. Perfect. So just by background, uh, probably useful to give you a little bit of context in terms of what we're talking about here. Um, this uh, continuum from an academic uh, journal article by Milgram and Cascino uh, goes back quite a while, but I think it's still stands the test of time in terms of helping us to understand what we're talking about today. On the left hand side, you have the real environment. On the right hand side, you've got an environment where you're totally immersed uh, and unconnected with the real world, both in terms of visual, but also your other senses. And then something in the middle, somewhere in the middle, you've got a mixed reality, which has got two dimensions to it, augmented virtuality, which is much less common where uh, you'd be in a, immersed in a virtual world, but can see elements of the real world, for example, your hands much more commonly to the left of that augmented reality, which is the ability to display digital overlays on the real world. And those digital overlays can be very simple, like text or, the, or 2D images like a video, or of course they can be much more elaborate. And we'll, in this presentation, talk about how technology is allowing much more elaborate three-dimensional uh, imagery and digital um, assets to be overlaid on the real world, which I think is where there's a lot of interest and a lot of focus. So um, I want to get a sense of my audience where you're at at the moment. So Lorraine has kindly helped me to put together a very quick poll. And if uh, you could load that, uh, people can um, push ahead and uh, give us your answer. One, one response to the following question, which best describes your current status in your organization as best you understand it? Uh, currently not using AR and VR in the, in the organization, currently not using it, but there are plans in train for pilot initiatives, currently using it in some pilot project or using it in live scalable project. In other words, are you using these technologies at scale within the organization as I've described them there? So I think we can see from a very quick uh, overview here that it's fair to say that most people uh, who are looking at the adoption curve are still at the early stages of the adoption curve. And that doesn't surprise me. It kind of mirrors what we've seen around most of the countries in, in the world, with the exception of some Asian countries where we've seen a lot higher levels of deployment. So hopefully in the presentation uh, today, you'll get a sense of where this technology could actually be deployed in your own organizations or in your own educational context. So thanks for running the poll. Um, I'm just going to give one quote from uh, Zuckerberg, which was uh, something I've been using on slides for quite some time, uh, where he says, 
We're making a long-term bet that immersive virtual and augmented reality will become a part of people's daily lives. This is long before the organization moved to uh, rename itself as Meta. Going back about two years or more, he's had this perspective on where the organization is going. Uh, a quote that I often like to, uh, a person rather I often like to quote is Ray Amara, who may be known to some of you, he's a futurologist and uh, looks a lot at the world of uh, technology and he said uh, that we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short term uh, but underestimate the effect in the long run and I think that's probably a pretty good description of where we are today in terms of AR and VR. I certainly remember um, you know a few years ago showing some early iterations of VR headsets to students and I think it's fair to say I was met with ridicule at the time there was a sense of this is never going to take off they're big they're clunky there's lots of wires hanging out of them um, and in response to those students, I, I, I tend to show them some videos to give them a bit of a sense of where uh, the technology is evolving over time. Now, uh, this little short clip, I think, will give you a sense of back in 1989, how people saw the opportunity for the mobile phone, which is relatively limited, I think it's fair to say. Go where you want to go, call when you want to call. Get the lowest price ever at Radio Shack on the most powerful transportable cellular phone system. Just $7.99 when you sign up with Radio Shack's authorized cellular phone carrier. Go where you want to go. There's nothing else to buy, and it's ready to go wherever you go. Call when you want to call. Use in your car, or go portable and take it along. Radio Shack's complete transportable cellular phone system. Just $7.99 only at Radio Shack, the technology store. So it was a very narrow view perspective of what the phone might be like and uh, social sharing in that instance, I think meant bringing a friend along to carry the phone with you it was so, so heavy. Today, of course, when we talk about augmented and virtual reality, I was going to share with you some slides, which take up a bit of time from Gartner. Some of you may have heard of Gartner, which is a, a consulting organization who look at uh, what's called the hype cycle, the extent to which a technology is being adopted and diffused in the population at large. But in fact, I've nothing to show you because VR and AR no longer exist on the emerging technologies hype cycle. So Lorraine, that's the end of my presentation. It's no longer an emerging tech, according to, uh, to Gartner. Um, and they actually said as, as far back as about 18 months ago that it already was reaching a mature state. So for most of the people in the call who are not currently using it, the reality is that for a lot of organizations, it is now being deployed both at pilot level and at scale level to achieve high levels of efficiency and or uh, enhance the experience for consumers. Now, in the rest of my presentation, I'll do a bit of a, 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 an overview of how AR and VR is used across different sectors. But this graph, I think, from Statista gives you a sense of the uh, opportunity. Leave aside the numbers, because I don't believe any of these numbers, because they're driven by hype and they're driven by investors, and people looking for funds, etc. But I think... The growth pattern is pretty clear and also the split, the relative split between the business and the consumer um, applications of AR and VR, I think is worth noting. And broadly speaking, it's seen that there's likely to be as much opportunity in the enterprise and business to business context as there is in the consumer context. So in my presentation, I'm trying to um, I'm going to touch on examples of both dimensions, namely B2B uh, and B2C as we evolve. And I'll touch on some of the ones there, healthcare, uh, real estate, retail, uh, education, obviously, and video games, uh, which are big drivers, particularly the latter in terms of VR at the moment. Um, this is your opportunity uh, to pay close attention and then get your bluffer certificate uh, when you're talking to people in the pub at the weekend to throw in a few choice technical terms to show your mastery of AR and VR. So pay close attention as I tell you just the insider track in terms of how the hardware is evolving because it is it is worth understanding that uh, before we talk about the applications of different businesses. Just a few years ago here in the college we would have had a setup similar to this where you needed an expensive headset, you needed an even more expensive PC, you needed room sensors in order to have the VR experience. Now with inside, what's called inside out tracking and the latest headsets, you have the capability for what's called six stuff. Now this is one phrase you should probably learn off, which stands for six degrees of freedom. Namely, the latest headsets don't need any wires to attach themselves to any PCs, and they do allow you to roam, as it were, within a space, typically a two meter by two meter space. And that's the critical factor. It does allow you to play uh, engaging games, for example, or in a workspace environment to mimic a workstation, for example. This is really crucial to understand how VR has evolved. Uh, the early versions of VR were not technically VR anyway. They had what was called 3DOF, rolling, pitching, and yawning. So you're a passive recipient. But as I said, 
we're moving into a much more engaged uh, environment. So probably the most popular six dot headsets out there, um, Oculus Quest, some of you may have heard of, which is now being rebranded as MetaQuest, surprise, surprise. Um, analysts uh, during the week reported, and it wasn't fully disclaimed by Facebook that they've sold already 10 million of these headsets, which is a real fill up to the industry in terms of where it could go because ecosystem's important. And on the right hand side, Pico, uh, which is a very popular headset for enterprises, slightly more expensive. And uh, the MBA students who are watching here in the call, they did have an opportunity to experience both of those headsets a couple of weeks ago. So it'd be interesting to see what they thought of those uh, headsets. Uh, VR is evolving, and uh, you know, at the moment we talk about VR in, in a fairly narrow sense, namely excluding uh, uh, the, what we can see, or maybe putting on a headset. But of course, a lot of the focus for real immersion is trying to use other uh, technologies to enhance our true sense of immersion, most notably what's called haptic technology. And what haptic means is just the ability to sense something. And in the last week, just in the last week, Facebook have filed a major patent for a glove. So as well as your VR headset from Facebook. I think you could comfortably expect maybe by this time next year, uh, the games that run on Facebook uh, Oculus uh, will also come with a glove, which they'll be selling you presumably at a tidy, tidy price, price too. So six stops and haptic technology are the two things I'd like you to remember in terms of VR and how that's evolving. When it comes to AR, augmented reality, as I said, is the imposition or uh, uh, overlay of uh, uh, digital information in the real world. A couple of things are really evolving at pace in the technology at the moment. And they're facilitated by artificial intelligence. And I know, Lorraine, you know, artificial intelligence is something that in the series we'll be talking about. And it is worth sort of linking the different topics together. So when we talk about um, artificial intelligence in the context of augmented reality, we're talking about what you see there on the left, which is from Niantic. They just released this in the last two weeks to uh, their home thousands of developers. My object is behind Pokemon Go. And this is what's called semantic segmentation. It's really important because if they, with computer vision, which is a form of AI, it's now able to identify what you're looking at. And that's really important if you're playing games or if you're uh, running augmented reality experiences outside, because it needs to know, is that water to stop you you know, for example, chasing uh, a Pokemon Go across into, into a lake, for example, but it also allows us to uh, more mimic the real world by, for example, having balls bounce in the correct pattern, etc. Uh, they also have in Niantech an ability to map the world. So they're relying on their hundreds of thousands of developers to get out there in public and using their, their, their mobile phone, scan the environment, and that in turn becomes uh, an integrated map of the world. It's really interesting what's happening and how this provides opportunity for for gaming, outdoor pursuits, AR generally uh, in the future. Um, this is from the Niantic uh, conference, which they uh, launched what was called Lightspeed uh, just about 10 days ago. So this again was being used in the world of augmented reality. Niantic, who are on Pokemon Go, as I said, have hundreds of thousands of developers on their books. They've made their technology free for people to actually develop and create their own um, outdoor experiences in games. So we can expect to see a lot of social sharing, the ability, for example, to, for people to, on their mobile phones to see the same digital asset, but from different angles, which means that they can play, as you can see there, this is a concept video, obviously, but they can play uh, outdoors using AR. And of course, brands can get involved in this space too for things like uh, navigation would be an obvious example in the tourism space, uh, also uh, uh, history, storytelling, all of that would be relevant in the context of how the technology allows you to, to evolve. Um, another form of technology that's integrating with uh, augmented reality, which I think is really powerful in the future, is volumetric video. What volumetric video means is the ability to effectively capture a 3D version of a person or an, an, an inanimate object and overlay it in the real world. Um, so an example of this would be yours truly here. Uh, this is me giving a lecture, well, not really giving a lecture, but um, this is using a very simple form of technology to capture with just a phone and uh, an Irish company called Volograms who have developed an app which allow you to, as we're creating miniature uh, holographic um, uh, images. And uh, maybe this is the future of education. I'm sharing this with some of my colleagues. We were trying to think of a, a witty term to describe how you would uh, you know, integrate this into the classroom because maybe students would find it more uh, exciting if nothing else to have their lecture appear on 
literally on their desktop or their kitchen table and give the lecture rather than looking at a, at a flat screen all the time. So what we landed on at the end, by the way, don't all go all together, was no schooling. Okay, so I think uh, I think that that's maybe where we may be going in the near future. Because if you want to check that out, it's uh, an article called Volograms. It's it'll run on the latest versions of iPhone. You can have a lot of fun with that. It's called Volume. Is the is the app. So let me get into the meat in terms of some examples of uh, how VR, for example, can be used in a business to consumer context. Then I'll look at in business to business context and I'll do likewise for, for augmented reality. Um, Lorraine, is there any questions come in specifically that you want me to deal with now because we're going okay on time? Sorry, no, 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 no questions okay. just yet. So I'll, I'll push on. So, uh, when we talk about virtual reality in the context of uh, business to consumer markets, um, one area that uh, was an early application of this, even though strictly speaking it wasn't uh, virtual reality, would be the use of 360 videos. Coachella, which is the, you know, the big boutique festival in the United States, they were early adopters of this. Using uh, 360 degree cameras, they filmed the experience during the, the concert and then were able to send out these cardboard uh, boxes effectively where people were encouraged to download it on their phone, put their phone into the cardboard box, Google Cardboard as it was called, branded. And by uh, looking through the phone, they could get a sense of what it was like to be in the audience. So very simple, but actually quite effective way of promoting uh, to end users. Similarly, in the Irish context, uh, Fault Ireland could be quite successful in using um, the technology for promotion at overseas trade, for example, itself, they're looking at the Wild Atlantic Way uh, surfing experience, and it's been proven to be very successful by fall tournament in that context. That was using three dots, three degrees of freedom, um, and also, as I said, uh, using a technology that was relatively simple, but, but highly effective, and it did allow people to get a sense of an experience that would, might otherwise be risky or very expensive for them to travel to Ireland too. But moving beyond 360 video, which I think was, was very popular a few years ago, I think it's fair to say that gaming is now a big driver for virtual reality. And of course, it's one of the reasons why Facebook spent, spent so much money acquiring the Oculus uh, from Palmer. Um, lucky, uh, about six or seven years ago, they paid over $2 billion for it. Because they realized that, it was that gaming uh, would move from a two-dimensional environment to a, to a three-dimensional. That's certainly the case. And, this is a six dot game called Pistols Whip, one of my favorites. Um, as you can see there, it's quite immersive. Um, you don't move around that much backwards and forwards, but the later versions of the games will allow you to do a lot more. Um, but these games are already returning you know, tens of millions of um, revenue for, for the companies. And in their um, Facebook Connect conference, just a was two weeks ago when Meta was, was announced. Uh, Zuckerberg did say that next year, which is really big, that Grand Theft Auto, uh, which is one of uh, the biggest games around, is possibly the on consoles, is actually now going to be next year. Uh, I think you can expect that to be a massive thing to see if it's being The game is in the of the now have a sense that it's actually going to be in the mayhem of that of Grand Theft Auto. Um, in addition to gaming and related to gaming, I think another sector to really watch would be fitness. And that's probably of all the apps on the, uh, the Oculus Store, the fastest growing segment is undoubtedly fitness. One of the reasons for this, of course, is that the pandemic was primarily the work in the gyms. So they've uh, been looking and exploring at new ways to get a workout. I'm ready to do it. I can't Fit Put me on the stage now. I'm ready to rage now. Probably the feel like popular an animal stuck in the kitchen. Uh, I'm ready to break out. My time, my time. None of you people can tell me to stop. This time, like the last time. You better get ready to race in the time. Uh, it's really important. I step on the field. It's time to get real. I'm feeling so ruthless. Yeah. My time, my time. Yeah. Um, Alex, I think your audio is coming in and out. Okay. Hand over my crown. Hand over my heart. But it, what's of interest to me, and I suppose still remains a primary research area for me, is how virtual reality fits into the world of storytelling and brand storytelling in particular. Um, 
Sorry, Alex, I think um, your your mic is just, your sound is just kind of coming in and out a little bit. Okay. So it wasn't just the video. Is that any better? Maybe just adjust yeah, my mic? That, is it? That seems a lot better. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, um, I'll keep an eye on that. Um, yeah. Uh, brand storytelling and virtual reality is a, is a huge area of opportunity for, for brands. Um, you know, we're seeing some evidence of this already in the creation of pop-up experiences. So on the left there, that was one that was actually here in Dublin for Coca-Cola, uh, where you could put on a VR headset and, and be in Santa's sleigh and be surrounded by the iconographic imagery of Coca-Cola, including the, the truck, etc. Lego have something similar as well. And I think we're going to see a huge explosion in that where um, we do know that the immersive nature of VR uh, has a much better ability to cut through and to be sticky for want of a, a term uh, with audiences. Obviously doing at scale is, is, the, is the challenge, but certainly in terms of uh, connecting your brand and your brand story to audiences, it really is the best medium that you could imagine much stronger than uh, you know, media like uh, TV or cinema even, which would up till now have been seen as very, very strong media in that regard. Um, Perhaps not as obvious, but I think an interesting one, this won quite a few international awards from uh, Irish International, a Dublin-based agency who do all the ad, uh, campaigns for the Road Safety Authority. And they ran a campaign uh, called Consequences where they shot 360 video of people in a pub and also people in a car crash. And it was a way of linking into the TV campaign to really give you a visceral sense of what it would be like to be an irresponsible driver and to end up in a, in a car crash upside down in a car and then be transported to hospital. Uh, it won a lot of awards. And in fact, one of my uh, postgrad students did his thesis on this and um, found statistically that there was a much much higher level of recall of elements of the VR campaign than there was for a control group who were exposed to TV advertising and that was when he tested it two weeks afterwards as you know as well as the exposure he went back two weeks to the same grouping so um, and that that would be consistent with what we're seeing in a lot of uh, academic studies as well and of course when we talk about um, VR, virtual reality, and why companies like um, Facebook are interested in virtual reality. They make no secret of the fact that it's really about the ability to take their current platform, um, namely Facebook, uh, Instagram, and bring them into a 3D environment. That's really what has driven Zuckerberg and his vision. And if you do get a chance to look at his presentation at the Facebook Connect conference, that's the clear sense that you'll get. This is his vision. Uh, whether we buy into it or not, and it has a lot of dystopic dimensions to it, I think I'd be the first to say his vision is that, you know, we will be spending a lot, lot more of our lives in virtual environments and that the connections that we make in the future are likely to be social ones across these virtual spaces. Um, and, and, you know, F Facebook are putting a lot of investment into this, as we know, 10 billion is the, is the stated investment that they're putting into uh, this whole environment uh, in, the, in the next uh, decade or so. Um, I've spent some time in virtual environments. Um, I think it's fair to say that, you know, it's not the most sticky context these days. Uh, I am there. I'm the good looking guy at the fourth from the left uh, in VR. I know some of you probably say you look better in VR, but that's my avatar. And I actually attended the Air Immersive, which is the lobby group for the immersive tech business in Ireland. Uh, obviously, last Christmas, we, we just felt we couldn't meet up. And uh, maybe we'll be back to Christmas Party 21 this year again. And we had a bit of fun and someone played a guitar and we were able to meet in a, in a virtual space, which was called Alt, Alt Space with our headsets on. Um, you don't need to have the headsets, incidentally, uh, to, to, to enter some of these environments, but obviously it makes a big difference. So I think virtual environments, we're going to see a massive growth in them. They're linked into the metaverse, obviously, which has been in the media hugely in the last number of weeks uh, after Zuckerberg uh, mentioned it. Um, there's hundreds of definitions of the metaverse. Um, there's only one metaverse is certainly the first thing I would, would say, rather than lots of metaverses. Uh, a couple of definitions that I like, by the way, are uh, the internet in 3D, which is kind of an interesting way of thinking about the, the, the metaverse, and it's a connected series of virtual worlds. Or another definition that I saw recently was it's a digital twin of the world. So it's this merging of the physical and the virtual into a totally interconnected space. And that links in again to a topic in the emerging tech series of the Internet of Things, if you think about it, i.e. The, the ability to actually have everything that we physically see in the world has got uh, a, a space 
uh, a virtual a digital twin. And that's really important from the perspective um, of marketing and business as well. I'm not going to play the video from um, this video, but you, you can check it out yourselves afterwards, which is at Facebook Horizon Worlds, which is Facebook's play in terms of creating a virtual world. Uh, many of you are obviously on Facebook and you will undoubtedly be receiving many, many offers to uh, to, to work, uh, to, to play and we will work and play in, in Horizon Worlds uh, in, in the near, near future. And of course, um, there's a hardware dimension to this. Obviously, the better the experience will be if you if you purchase one of their headsets, the Oculus headsets, in order to have a real sense of being with people in a virtual space and being able to defy, as Zuckerberg himself said, um, and I thought it was a nice phrase that um, virtual reality helps us to defy the laws of space, time, and, and, and physics. And I think that's really interesting, you know, the fantasy dimension that we have, that we can become somebody else, we, we can become multiple, uh, have multiple identities, and uh, we can create a, a virtual environment for ourselves, which I suppose the last 18 months we've been kind of used to anyway. So but taking it up, turbocharging that, I suppose, is where uh, people like Zuckerberg see the future. But they're not alone in this. And there's a lot of people uh, saying that, you know, 10 years from now, will, Zuck Zuck will Facebook be the same powerhouse that it is? Well, that, the jury's out on that. But there are other um, developments and um, networks and environments to watch, I think. Um, Roblox, you may or may not have heard of, that's one to keep an eye on. This one may be not as well known to you, but it's hugely popular as millions of uh, early teenagers in the United States in particular would be familiar with uh, Blanco's Block Party. And what, what, what interests me about this is that a brand like Burberry are in that space. In other words, they have characters which are branded Burberry that you can acquire uh, in that space. And this concept of um, having digital assets that you can buy and that you can trade with each other is what we call NFTs, non-fungible tokens, which again is linked to another part of the series that you're engaged in, the MBA students, which is the, the concept of the blockchain and the ownership of digital assets, which in this lecture we, we clearly don't have time to go into, but it, it is important to see the context of how it links into other elements of uh, emerging technology that as brands uh, seek to play in this virtual space and as individuals seek to become self-creators in this space, ownership of your digital assets will assume a greater importance and hence uh, mechanisms to verify that ownership, namely blockchain, will, will grow in importance. Um, I could have shown you dozens of slides around uh, this area and it does interest me how, particularly in the area of fashion, luxury fashion, we've seen some of the top brands embrace this uh, wholeheartedly, I think it's fair to say. Gucci, for example, um, you know, have got uh, AR sneakers. So those, those are not real sneakers, though. Those are virtual, real, those are augmented sneakers uh, that you could buy on an app. I think it was $10 you had to buy to download the app to have these Gucci sneakers and, you know, give your phone to your friends and your friends then would see you wearing these, these virtual sneakers. They've also on Roblox uh, got um, a Gucci garden, believe it or not, which is effectively like a mini world in the Roblox virtual environment. So these luxury brands are looking to the future of um, the digital environment, digital twins as being a really key way for them to generate revenue, revenue in the future. And of course, the pandemic has been a big a catalyst and stimulus to that. Okay, short and sweet there. Um, now I'm going to move on to look at to look at B2B and virtual reality, how virtual reality can be used in business contexts or enterprise contexts, whatever you like to, to call it. Uh, and this has certainly been an area where even in a small country like Ireland, we are now seeing the emergence of companies who specialize in providing training solutions for uh, companies using VR. So the first area I would explore with you would be uh, the use of training uh, using virtual reality. Uh, this is a, these are a couple of stills from a Walmart, one of the Walmart training centers of which they have 200 globally, um, they actually purchased 17,000 Oculus headsets in order to give people on their front line a sense of what the experience in a retail Walmart would be. Among the experiences that they um, uh, created for employees was, which is very topical, was Black Friday. So they actually shot using 360 video in a store in the mayhem of Black Friday. And then using that footage, we're able to use that in the training room to say, hey, put on this headset and look around you and see these baying customers looking for the deals, etc." So it was a way of habituating, getting people used to what might be, uh, well, I won't call it a hazardous environment, but certainly training in VR is a very good way of dealing with hazardous environments. Um, um, there are a lot more hazardous ones than that, of course. 
Um, a company that have really uh, shown a lot of leadership in this area are uh, PwC, and uh, they did a very major piece of research last year. Um, they did it across 12 um, US locations. And what they looked at was how three different modalities of training could be used in a particular context. And the context was to train employees in inclusive leadership. So they created avatars, different avatars, different gender, different races, uh, got them to um, you know, perform scenarios and have people evaluate and interact with these avatars. And they, um, that was in the VR environment. They also uh, replicated that in two other contexts, namely an e-learning environment where people just worked at a PC and uh, they also had a standard classroom training environment. So they looked at the outputs from the, the training in terms of those three key three alternative learning platforms. And they found that comparing VR against the classroom, it was four times faster in terms of the uh, comprehension. Also, uh, respondents were 275% more confident in employing, learn, applying, applying the learning afterwards. Uh, they were 3.7 3 times more emotionally connected than the classroom learners. And they were much more focused than classroom learners. Um, they weren't quite as strong at the metrics against e-learning, incidentally, on some of those, and I'll share that in a slide in a moment. But it is a very powerful, and we need more research like this as academics. We need to be uh, helping industry and in really uh, developing these metrics. But it is a very powerful indicator of something that we know, going back to Edgar Dale's uh, cone of learning, that if you have action-oriented training, if you learn by doing you're much more likely to have higher levels of retention. And this is a validation of, I suppose, a theoretical construct in, in the real world, which I think is really interesting to observe. And clearly, companies like PwC have a leading consultancy role in this place. This slide, I think, is interesting because it's looking at, at what point uh, does VR training start to become cost effective? Because clearly, you know, in a classroom environment where you're standing in front of 30 or 40 students, that's much less expensive than supplying VR headsets and developing VR training simulations, etc. And what they found was quite interesting that at a critical point of about 1950 learners, VR training was more cost effective than e-learning and far more cost effective than the traditional um, classroom environment. So what this is telling us is that I think a lot of companies are going to invest more and more in VR training, particularly as the cost of the, the hardware and indeed the software fall. Just as an aside here, uh, it was announced just a few weeks ago that Accenture have purchased 60,000 Oculus VR headsets, which they will be using for onboarding uh, recruits globally uh, from, from, from now onwards. And the, the main driver for that, as well as the compelling case that you see there on the slide, was, of course, the pandemic. The reality is they were not able to welcome staff into their offices in the last 18 months. So they needed an alternative solution beyond just sending somebody a laptop. And uh, so VR was part of the solution. And uh, I think it's an interesting and pretty compelling vote of confidence, actually, in, in VR. Of course, they don't acquire 60,000 headsets without having done a lot of pilot studies beforehand as well. It's not something that they would just take a chance on. So I think that that's also further evidence of um, the, the really Im impressive and compelling taste actually, uh, test rather for using um, VR in, in training contexts. Uh, meetings and conferences is an area that, again, with the pandemic was was catapulted uh, into prominence, it's fair to say. And uh, I'm glad to say that an Irish company, you may not, people in the call mostly may not have heard of them, but they're really big players in the top three or four in the world in creating online VR meeting um, simulations. It's a company based in Waterford, a spin out from WIT. Uh, immersive VR education and they brand their um, meeting space Engage. And there's a free version, by the way, if you want to uh, download it. And again, you don't need a headset. You can look at it on your desktop and have meetings with uh, your colleagues across wherever. Um, and they've signed a deal with uh, HTC as their uh, primary supplier. Supplier. So um, we're going to see a lot more of this, and I could I could talk a lot more about it, but I, I suppose we'll we'll crack on. Healthcare is an area that's just hugely ripe in terms of its opportunity, particularly because of the way in which um, we learn and uh, in terms of activating people's memories, uh, etc. It's been used a lot already in in training and simulation, including here in Ireland, where RCSI are among the the leading. Um, uh, leading uh, medical schools in the world in using virtual reality uh, te technology. They've been won many awards, but also for therapy itself in its own right, particularly, for example, with people with dementia and Alzheimer's, where it's been proven to have a very therapeutic effect. So that's VR 
and uh, it's business to business and business to consumer. Now I'm going to move on to AR. And when we talk about augmented reality, we're talking about overlaying digital information on the real world. And from a business point of view, I think, uh, and a consumer perspective in particular, because that's what I'm looking at now, I think the company that we all have to watch is Snap, actually. Snap, um, who do an amazing thing in terms of lenses. I don't know if, if many of you have installed Snap Lens, but as well as the sort of fun stuff that you can see here, which is, uh, you know, yours truly appearing in either cartoon form or anime or uh, comic format. They've also signed multi-million deals in uh, recent months with companies such as L'Oreal, and also uh, well, with um, other Versace, for example. But this idea of being able to, yes, don't laugh. Uh, <laughs> uh, this idea of being able to improve and enhance your experience with virtual try-ons is something that uh, is growing hugely. It started in, in retail context, and now we're seeing it uh, being employ, employed um, on desktop and on mobile devices, and particularly the closed loop where you're able to, as it were, uh, make the transaction in the app itself. So virtual try-on, um, an area that's growing rapidly, but the Snap uh, technology is also really powerful for uh, gamers. So they have, uh, again, like Niantic, they've opened up their platform for people to develop AR apps, and they also have a, a Snapchat. I'm Lucas Risotto. I'm an augmented reality creator, and I created Monkey Racing. Monkey Racing is an augmented reality game in which you get to build your own racetracks by playing with your environment, but there's also a twist. You see, this lens has some technology built into it that analyzes how you're moving. And the more you move and sound like a monkey as you're racing, the better your final score will be. So I don't know if you want to create something like that, but I'm sure you could come up with something um, unique, maybe Irish, maybe local. But the interesting thing is that these tools are being democratized at an enormous rate. You really don't need programming tool now, tools. And certainly in the next year or two, it's getting even more democratized. So people will be able to create their own AR experiences uh, and literally leave them in a particular physical space and invite their friends to do so. I suppose that's the benign view. If you listen to the CEO of Niantech, who would take a different view from Facebook, you know, he his view of the future is not a future where we're all involved uh, and spend our lives in virtual environments. It's actually a more benign environment where we're all outdoors and we're playing AR games. And I suppose parents of young children would like to imagine that this could be the future rather than their kids being. And, you know, maybe it's a way that AR can indeed become a more ubiquitous uh, technology by digitizing the play space, uh, making it fun and interactive and social and sharing where you could, you could, you know, share the same game space, even though you're on different planet, different planets. Well, that would be really cool, but different continents anyway. Um, Sorry. Uh, Ikea Place is a well-known uh, app, which would be allowing you to place something on a particular space in your own room. And the latest version of this allows you to place multiple objects. So you can really do a visualization of what your room would look like with multiple pieces of furniture. It's been an incredible success. It's six or seven years in existence already. And Ikea have rolled out uh, many different iterations on it. Uh, the virtual mirror uh, is something that we're seeing in a lot of stores. Um, this is yours truly looking very dashing in a Heidi Klum. Uh, Heidi Klum, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. She just shows how much I really know about fashion, um, which is a pop-up store run by Lidl uh, here in the city centre. But this idea of virtual uh, clothing is going to be huge, uh, particularly as cameras and the chips get more powerful. Uh, Try-ons of glasses is, is a massive area of growth as well. Um, goggles for you, if you want to check that one out, you can try on hundreds of pairs of uh, glasses virtually. And again, they expanded enormously in the pandemic as people didn't feel that they could go into retail stores. And they took a lot of share from companies like Specsavers, who were very slow to the party in terms of uh, virtual try-on. Uh, it's not just augmenting the person, it's obviously augmenting things, places, objects. Uh, BMW have signed deals with Snapchat to allow people to virtually place the latest model of the BMW 1 series in their own driveway or on a road, which in turn, and they can change the color, the, the, the wheel configuration and share it with each other. Again, a lot of growth potential in that. My own background academically is in the tourism area. I don't have time to go through some of the examples in this, and I've done research in this area already around uh, enhancing attractions and tours using augmented reality is undoubtedly going to grow enormously in, in the coming years. And already the pandemic has been a stimulus to two or th three attractions I would know in Dublin who've started to invest in this. Interactive packaging, um, from an FMCG, fast moving consumer goods perspective, 
there are enormous opportunities to uh, make your packaging work beyond the two-dimensional, uh, particularly an example here, which I won't play the video, but it's 19 Crimes, which you may have noticed this wine, it's widely distributed which is based on a story of 19 convicts who went to Australia. So uh, by downloading the 19 Crimes app and scanning and looking through your mobile phone, each of these characters come alive, one of them in a hideous Irish accent, but we'll forgive them that the idea is a pretty good one uh, in terms of bringing your packaging to life. And I've done exercises with some students here where we've done, uh, done um, concepts around that. I have a group at the moment working on a, um, a Mr. Tato AR app, for example. So Mr. Tato coming to life and doing something Christmassy, you know, keep you posted on that one see what see what concepts they come up with uh, basically anything and this is this is uh, adapted from blipper who are one of the leading um, houses for uh, AR uh, design work with a lot of the top brands globally but anything effectively can be uh, AR enabled so it's not just the print and not just packaging but tv is one area that i think we're going to see a big growth in uh, namely people are going to be encouraged to scan a qr code in the middle of an advert or in the middle of a program and, and AR experience is likely to literally literally pop out of the tv at you i think we'll see a big expansion of that in, in the near future uh so that's something to watch finally uh in terms of b2b and augmented reality and again spend a long, long time thinking about how augmented reality could be used in a in a business to business context. And I think one of the main drivers for this is innovation around smart glasses, namely the ability to allow people to be hands free in, a, in an environment which may or may not be hazardous or may may involve complex manipulation, for example, training, repair, processing, etc. And um, allowing you to 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 do so, um, as I said, with, with, with hands-free. And the, the headsets there are typically quite expensive, but the use cases and the ROI dimensions are so compelling that it's one of the early lead adoption markets for augmented reality. Not so much in consumers where the headsets are, would be prohibitively expensive around the, you know, 1,500, 2,000 euros you're probably talking about for most of the headsets. But for enterprises, this still can pay back very, very quickly. Um, I have a question, but I might share this with the MBA group uh, in the second session, just for the benefit of time, because I want to finish up and then we can take some questions if that's okay. But you may, may be able to think of examples of how AR can help enterprises. Let me share with you um, just a few uh, examples. This is uh, cited in the Michael E. Porter article that hopefully you've uh, got a reference for there in the chat, so you can, you can look this up in more, more detail. Um, but there are some pretty compelling figures here in terms of the ability of augmented reality. Uh, typically, all of these examples were where people were using um, glasses, eyewear, uh, to, to do so. But for example, warehouse picking, where the DHL operative is in the warehouse. In the past, they would have typically walked down the aisle or on their, um, their forklift truck, obviously, and they would have had a document in front of them or they might have had a laptop screen telling them where they had to pick up a particular pallet, for example. Obviously, if they don't need to consult with another document, if everything is in their line of sight because they're looking through uh, the lens of a smart glasses, it can improve both their speed but also their accuracy. They're less likely to make a mistake because they're not looking at another document and get their eye moving, their eye gaze moving away from the object that they're picking up, for example. So that's pretty compelling. I think probably the most compelling, and I, I was at a presentation in the UK last year from the Augmented Reality Enterprise Alliance, where uh, one of the speakers was talking about this. He'd flown in from the United States. Newport News sounds like a newspaper, I know, but it's actually the biggest shipbuilder in the United States. And they build a ton of um, American uh, naval vehicles as well as uh, uh, merchant ships, et cetera. But I thought it was just an incredible statistic, which he was able to validate that the typical inspection in the past was a day and a half to inspect a, a, a ship that it was uh, you know, ready for the high seas. But all of the information on that is now overlaid into an app, which actually Actually, people is, is on, a, on a headset. So as they're walking around, they're able to see green ticks saying this, this is where it should be, this item is where it should be. So everything in the boat is where it should be. And in the past, uh, that, you know, that took an enormous amount of time, but it can now be done in as little as an hour and a half. So there are huge time savings. There are obviously big debates around that. I'm sure some of you are thinking about it. Well, where does this leave a lot of jobs um, uh, in the future? And I think that's, that's an interesting one to sort of debate uh, over time. My view would be that it, it's the same scenario, same debate as you might have over artificial intelligence in, in another lecture, namely, um, may not replace jobs per se, but certainly tasks will be replaced by augmented and virtual reality. And then it's a, it's a matter of how people organize those tasks in a managerial sense that new jobs, entirely new roles will be created for the management of those tasks as we, as we evolve.
So that's been a pretty whistle stop tour, I think it's fair to say. Um, but I did want to respect the time. Uh, I don't know if you've got any questions. If you've not, yep. we, can, we can go to a little survey as well, which we have on standby. Yeah, no, we do just have a couple of questions. And, um, I'll, and I'll stop that, sharing, Alex. if I may. You're gonna stop share? I can stop sharing, yep. can't I? Yep, yep. Uh, thanks, Alex. That was, that was really interesting. Um, you frightened me a little bit now when you start talking about virtual sneakers, because last night we were looking online at the runners that the boys want for Christmas. And now you're telling me that I'm going to be buying them virtual sneakers. <laughs> I'm telling you that's yeah you might you might escape with just it depends how fa how fast they, they're growing etc but you, you might escape but I do expect this to be yeah I, I actually genuinely do think that you know boys and girls in a few years time will be asking for virtual sneakers as part of their Christmas present yeah yeah well I, I did think you know um when they first asked you know can they buy you know money for Fortnite I thought you know, what are you talking about? How are you going to put money into this Fortnite? I'm sure I quick enough learned how you can put money into Fortnite and those exactly. games. Yeah. But um, one question, and I have one that's kind of similar to it. And I was kind of thinking, I know you mentioned the jobs and that's probably more for, for AI. But do you see a kind of downside to this um, virtual reality and the augmented reality? And I, as you were talking through it, I remember a couple of years ago, um, my son was downloading an app for a pizza delivery. And I swear, it took him about an hour to download this app. And I thought, like, have you forgotten how to just pick up a phone? You know, like, is there a, a danger that we'll spend too much in the online environment, too much time in the online environment? Is there a danger? Well, I, you know, there's there are different perspective on how much time we will spend in it. That's the first point I think I'd make, you know, as I said, you know, people like Niantic and John Hank, who's the CEO, you know, he'd be quite strong on the fact that uh, he, he doesn't want to see a scenario where we're spending a lot of our lives in a virtual environment. Now, he has skin in the game. It's in his interest that, you know, we, we, we were outdoors and using his app to, you know, explore the world and understand the world better. Um, is there a danger? Yeah, there is a danger. Absolutely. And, you know, that's it, it's not a black or white scenario. Uh, you know, we, I didn't even begin to touch on the issue of privacy and data and, and that, mm -hmm. which is, again, a huge topic in its own right you know it's one thing um you know having reservations about your activity being tracked in a 2d world as in you know cookies and how you navigate an internet page which is essentially a 2d world but if you think about the amount of data that will be created by brands uh who can track how people operate in a 3d world i mean at a very simple level the latest um headsets that are evolving like hp reverb to uh, omnicept uh, headset which i've tried last year i think it'll be commonplace by the way the vast majority of vr headsets within the space of a couple of years will have eye tracking built into them okay and uh, the reason that they will have eye tracking built into them ostensibly at one level is to allow for a better gaming experience so that people mm. are so that using artificial intelligence um, programs it can identify what you're looking at and it can focus in on that and without getting too technical uh, it, it can create a, a, a better visual experience for you but of course that also means that it's tracking you know what products you're looking at in a virtual shop etc so the amount of data that's going to be created is exponential relative to what we're currently um, tracking so that is where there is a role for for regulators um, undoubtedly and there's also i suppose a role for personal responsibility as well yeah. in terms of the amount of time that we spend or that we allow our children to spend in these environments yeah yeah definitely and in a comment that came in um just as you went through some examples was that they can see the benefit in the retail and really enhancing the online purchase experience i suppose that that the yeah. try on and things like that you know it's you you feel probably you know it, it's getting as close as you can probably to the the physical retail environment and um, there's just another um, question in the chat here which i'll just read out to you and um, you mentioned a few examples of applications in tourism so post COVID, do you think we will go back to seeing VR just as a promo tool for travel destinations um, once we can visit them again ourselves? Or will the sustainability imperative mean VR might come into its own? Yeah, it's a good Very question. I, I, question. It is a good question. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would think both is the long and short, but I definitely think that um, VR will uh, continue to play a role, expanding role for um, in the sales and marketing process, um, particularly where people can't justify or won't be allowed to travel as much to, to you know, for site visits, etc. So definitely that that's going to continue to grow. Um, and, uh, you know, that would would be around the 360 film. I, you, the 
if the sustainability one is fascinating and interesting, and there's a very strong case for virtual reality to be used in a sustainability context, either a substitute, an entire substitute for travel to a particular destination or within a particular destination, including, you know, um, areas of natural beauty or sensitive heritage landscapes, that it would be supplemented, you know, the experience in an interpretive center would be supplemented by uh, more virtual reality. In, in a sense, the tourism industry has moved in that direction with, you know, the growth in interpretive centers uh, and careful management of tourism flow. So to me, it's a natural outflow of that, that the VR experiences, particularly high-end VR experiences that people can't currently afford in their own home. I think that we will see more of those mm. getting installed, installations in, in tourism and heritage attractions. Absolutely, yeah. 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 I mean, uh, uh, sorry, was, I mean, the, the area of uh, tourism does interest me hugely. I definitely think as well as the VR, I, I think more likely, I think we'll see um, uh, AR expand in the tourism context as, as the tools get uh, less expensive and also as the ability for them to allow social sharing and co-creation of content. I think we will see a lot more curated uh, tours uh, using augmented reality by, by locals, for example, where people can, you know, um, and that one of the advantages of that is it's, um, it can be adjusted in time uh, specific in a, in a way that VR can't so easily done. So I, you can definitely see how it could be used in con conjunction with events, retail offers within a particular location, uh, management of tourism flows, et cetera. So VR will, will definitely have a role in heritage attractions, but I think AR is likely to be the, the, the more dominant technology as we move forward. Okay, great. Yeah, and I, one of the examples that you had there, I thought was really interesting, was around kind of training, using this technology for training, and particular for induction. Because in the last two years, you know, we would have spoken to a lot of students that moved into maybe their first job, and it was all online, you know, and the kind of the difficulties of you know being handed a laptop, and that's kind of it, you know, kind of meeting your the team through Teams or through Zoom. Um, so I could definitely see how it can help with training, especially training in different environments and ensuring a consistency around staff training um, and things like that. Um, another question that came in was, um, you know, what kind of investments are companies kind of making? And that's probably a very broad kind of questions, but are they measuring the return on investment? And, and what's that looking like? Yeah, it's a good question. My um, sense is here in Ireland, there is there is growing interest, but it's still, um, and that's why I posed the question at the outset, what was the, the, the distinction between a pilot and uh, deployment at scale? I think in Ireland, mostly we're seeing people uh, doing so in a pilot fashion. Um, I think in markets like uh, Korea, the United States in particular, we're now starting to see it deployed at scale. The example I gave of Accenture, you know, they I know they had done a lot of pilot testing and um, you know it, within the industry there's a certain within the industry of AR and VR creators there's a kind of frustration this uh, pilot purgatory I think is the phrase that they use this idea that you know they've got a lot of projects on the go but they're within the innovation teams within organizations and it's they're finding it hard to sort of make the breakthrough from the innovation team into the, the top board of management suddenly getting on on board with I do think the pandemic has changed the sentiment though there, you know that's what I'm hearing talking to people uh, in the space who make AR and VR and particularly for VR training they, they are saying that the nature of the conversations they're having now are substantially different than they were say a year ago because uh, organizations realize that this is not a short-term thing this is something that strategically they need to do for for the, the long run in terms of investment that is a little bit like asking how long is a piece of string to be honest in terms of the yeah. deployment and scale it really is um, and it depends on what the business objectives are you know for AOR deployment and apps you you know uh, within tourism context you're probably talking in the range 25 to 50 to 60 thousand euros to develop one of those experiences uh, having said that the Dublin Stockton's digital trail, which is not purely AR, by the way, it's, it's broader than that. And I, I was uh, involved on the helping um, create the tender document rather that wasn't obviously on, on the, the evaluation, but just advising in, in, in terms of the 10. That, that, for example, was, is, is a half million uh, euro um, project. So, it, it, you know, there's a huge spectrum in between those two, even, even in the tourism industry in terms of what you could, what you can invest. ROI, coming back to that question, yes, there, there are, and if people are interested, I can share some examples with that, particularly in the marketing area would be the area I'd be familiar with. Uh, training, I don't have as much data, but I could probably get that as well for you. I mean, I think I think training ROI by its nature is probably a little bit more nebulous because of the, you know, the the, the time horizon against which you're judging the return is mm -hmm. is possibly harder to 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 identify. 
Yeah, yeah, and I suppose it is it is important that companies can see the return on investment for this, and it's not just you know something to do because because everybody's doing it, and you'll get lost behind if you don't. Uh, I know we're coming up on the time, so I might just ask one final question. And as you mentioned, the metaverse, um, a question came in: um, How far away do you think the idea of the metaverse and and us all being in the metaverse um, is kind of to to become a reality? Well, we're in we're in the early stages of the metaverse mm-hmm. in the sense it's not something that you know we flick a switch and we're in the metaverse. It's it's happening around us right now as we speak. It's been built. The, the building blocks are, are being put in place. Zuckerberg is obviously, you know, putting a, a gigantic big stake in the ground in terms, you know, not least by naming his company Meta, which obviously got the rankles of, of a lot of other uh, companies who see themselves as big players in the space. Um, how this will evolve will be very interesting to see. I mean, I, I would be of the view that, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in how this will evolve. And, uh, you know, that, that would even extend to making predictions about how strong Meta will be in this space in five to 10 years. I do think that, you know, all of us need to keep an eye on, on, on um, what's happening around um, uh, content creation and the democratization of the web. And, uh, you know, the, the metaverse is really one metaverse, but it's um, a series of interconnected and interoperable virtual environments, which in turn are linked to the real world through the IoT phenomenon, and et cetera. Um, but it will, you know, it will expand at, a, at an enormous rate in terms of our lives and in terms of the amount of time that we spent. Uh, there'll be some lead markets in the B2C market. It's undoubtedly going to be the gaming market um, is going to be a big, big driver of that market. Uh, and in the enterprise market, I definitely think it's um, it's, it's the training environment and uh, process manufacturing environment where we're seeing, you know, re- very, very clear returns on investment already. Okay, great. Well, thank you again, Alex. That was a really interesting and a really engaging seminar. Um, I got an awful lot from it. And just to the participants, as I mentioned at the start, this is the second of our six week series on um, emerging technologies. Um, So we'll have seminars for the next four weeks again on Fridays at 3 p.m. Um, and next week we'll be joined by Larry Kyo on the topic of blockchain, which Alex mentioned um, this evening. So we hope you can join us for some future events. So thanks again, Alex. Thank you. Do you, want, do you have time to do that little survey at the end or not? Um, I, I think we're just up on the time, but I, okay. the poll yeah. has decided not to work for me as well. That's fine. So. Okay. Well, listen, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to everybody. And uh, people have my details in the chat there if they do want to follow up. I'm very interested, particularly with organizations who are at that stage where they're thinking of deploying AOR and VR, certainly be interested to have a conversation. We do have viral within the um within the tu dublin organization which is a, a dedicated a virtual reality and augmented reality lab um which we can you know talk to companies about working with them on on pilot projects as i've described earlier great thanks and just to just to let you know an awful lot of the chat are coming directly into me so there's lots of thank you and um, people outlining that it was a fantastic session oh thank you That's great. thanks alex thanks, everybody Take bye care, bye everyone everybody.